What would it be like? Just think for a minute. What would it be like if every person just in this room, we'll just pick on ourselves today, got super sensitive to personal sin in their life? What would happen if we did that? Well, there's a passage of Scripture this morning I want to read for you that I think speaks to this. Obviously, Apostle Paul had a lot to say about things like this, but in Ephesians chapter 5, in particular, the first seven verses, he says, "...as therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know certainly, it says, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man or an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for it says, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, he says, do not be partakers with them. What would it be like if those of us that claim that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior walked daily super sensitive to personal sin? God, we are really good to point the finger at other people and point out the flaws in other people's lives. That's easy to do. It's almost a sport today. But God, I pray today somehow we could turn and look into the mirror and only see ourselves. I love that Isaiah 6 passage where Isaiah's gone to the temple to mourn the king's death. And he got to see the Lord high and lifted up. And when he saw himself for who he was and saw God for who he was, what did he say? I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people with unclean lips. When he saw God for who he was, he saw himself for who he was. And I pray somehow today, God, that we could see ourselves in the reflection of who you are. And that when we leave this place, God, we'll be just a little bit more sensitive to the personal sin that is in our lives. Help me preach this sermon, God. I feel the attack. I know that Satan does not want me to talk about this this morning. But give me courage, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I read a quote recently that will not leave my mind. It's this. We live in a world today that has become so churchy. And at the same time, the church has become so worldly. Wow. We live in a world today where the world has become very churchy, and at the same time, the church has become more worldly. We are even designing churches today to make the world comfortable. Did you know that God never intended his church necessarily to be a comfortable place for lost people? He wants, there's a little bit of discomfort that comes from learning the gospel. It seems like, let's just make it all like the world. What is amazing today to me is that in our world today, it's really hard to see a distinguished characteristic between that person who claims to be saved and that person who's not. Our habits seem to be the same. Our language seems to be the same. It seems like the things that we dress like and look like and want to be like, it seems like it's the world and not like him. Did you know that the Bible says that God is working daily to make you more into the image of his son Jesus? While he's trying to do that, we seem to be wanting to be more like the world today. And so at the same time that the world's becoming churchy, churchy meaning talking down and they have their roles too and making fun of those that actually love the Lord, the church in return is becoming more like the world. And when there's no distinction between that one that is a, a follower of Christ and that one that is not, something is really messed up in the world. Amen. And I would trace it back to a sensitivity to personal sin. Are you sensitive to sin? Do you sometimes even the thought of doing something that you know is not wrong, does the Holy Spirit stop you, delay you, bring to your attention that that's not the right way? If that's not happening in your life, I can promise you one of two things is true. Either you do not know the Lord at all, or you've gone so far from God that you don't even feel his nudge anymore. 
You don't sense and hear the Holy Spirit saying to you that's the wrong thing. I'm here to submit to you, the closer you get to Jesus, the more sensitive you'll become to personal sin. And often even before you even do the wrong thing, when you think it, there'll be an intersection right then that says, no, that's not the right thing to do. It is God's will for us to grow closer to him with the passing of every day. And I pray that in my life, and I pray in your life as I've lived this life, that I've gotten closer to him and more sensitive to his way and his will in my life. It seems like that's not what we're seeing today. We all fall short of God's glory. Make sure you hear me say this. We fall down every single day. You've heard me preach this. It's one of the few things on the internet I get a lot of feedback from when I say this. So why don't I just get some people to send me some hate mail by saying this. I don't believe a human being can stay pure, completely pure for five minutes. We'll think something we should not think. We'll say something we should not say or do something we should not do. Now, maybe if you really concentrated, you know, come, don't pick on me on that, but I don't think we can go five minutes without thinking something or what, saying something, whatever it may be. So, we fall short of God's glory every single day. I need, and you need every day, to go to him and ask for forgiveness and ask him to purify me and to wash me. I need that just as much as you do. That's not what I'm talking about. There's a big difference between being a person who falls short of God's glory on a daily basis and living in rebellion against the Spirit of God. And that's really what, more what I'm talking about today. If you can live in rebellion against the Spirit of God for a long period of time and not have something in your life that draws you back to Him, you really ought to question whether you're truly a child of God. There should be a desire in your heart to be sensitive to personal sin and to learn from the experiences that we go through. It's little wonder that Paul would write this passage of Scripture that we see, but it's not an isolated event at all. You can go find what he wrote to the Romans in the same way, and certainly the church at Corinth, he picked on them big time. He comes to simply say this, that we are saints before God. I get that, that we've been, the sin has been washed away. The battle has been, is ended because of what Christ has done. But we still live in this world, and as we live in this world, that we ought to be pursuing holiness in our lives to be as much like Jesus as we possibly can be with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so that we should be different. Not weird, we should be different. Not weird, but different. There should be something about us. There should be sermons that we preach every day of our lives by what we do and don't say instead of say and the things we choose and the places we choose to go and the habits we choose not to have. There are even things that maybe are okay to do, but you know it might bring, shed poor light on who Christ is, and so we choose not to do those things. There's a super sensitivity in our lives to sin. And I'm here to tell you, you can be a barrel of laughs and a fun person to be with and still be super sensitive to personal sin. In fact, you might find out you can actually go and have a really good time and stay away from all the things you think you need to have to have a good time. He is enough. And so it's a little wonder Paul would write passages like this and, and passages like I'll talk about in just a moment. But let's talk about how do we carry out this, this mandate to become more sensitive to personal sin in our lives. This particular passage starts with a reminder. Write that down. Notice the reminder. Right off the bat, he reminds us of a few things that are incredibly important. The first thing, if you want to write this down, the first reminder is this, who we are. Who we are. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. He goes on to say in verse 2 these words, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Notice these first words again. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Do you know who you are today? You're a beloved child of God. Before y'all get all up and you think, hey, I'm a, I'm a child of God. You're a child of God not because you're awesome. You're a child of God not because you're really incredibly cool. You're not a child of God because you're really pure. You're a child of God because of an incredible work that God did for you in your stead. We were sinners by nature and by choice when he rescued us. We were doing the exact opposite of who we wanted to be and should be. He rescued us from ourselves. And so before you got all up here, I'm a child of God. And look down your long nose at everyone. You're a child of God only because of an, an incredible work that God did that only he could do through Christ Jesus on the cross. The finished work on the cross is the only reason you can call yourself a child of God. It's not you. It's him. It's him. And so... When you take that in, that should be a humbling thing for every one of us. We come across words like these in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. As a child of God, listen to these words. Just as 
He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. Why did he save you? Why did he invest in you? Why did he choose to go on the cross and, and die for you? As the Bible says, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Why did he do that? It's because he wants you to become more and more super sensitive to personal sin. We'll never reach perfection. We're not going to get there. But there should be something that happens in our life that we move the target down the road just a little bit, that we grow to be more like him and act more like him and talk more like him and explain to this world who Jesus is often without words. And so the first thing we need to know is today, we're children of God. That's who you are. When it's all said and done, you're not a pastor, Phil, or you're not whatever you are in your possession, or not just a father, or not just a grandfather, or grandmother, or whatever. No, above all else, you're a child of God, and you're only there because he placed you there through his finished work on the cross. Number two, what we do. Don't miss this. What do we do? He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. What do we do? Well, there's a couple things he mentions here. Number one, the first thing that we do is we're to be imitators. Did you see that in verse, verse one again? He says, be imitators. A really interesting word, this word imitators, where we get the word mimic is memnes. It literally means to mimic or to copy something in someone else. We're to be copies of who he is, right? Therefore, be imitators. Mimic what you see in Christ. The first thing he tells us is to walk in love, to mimic him. I'm here to tell you today that's impossible in your strength. I know you're good and know you have a big heart, but you can't mimic Jesus in this area of walking in love without a supernatural work of God in your life. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in place, right? He lives within our very lives. He motivates us. He prays for us. He's the one who nudges us. He's the one that helps us be more like Jesus Christ. And so mimic him in walking in love. That's what we're to do, and that's what we're to be. And as we do that, obviously, we'll become more sensitive to the personal sin in our lives. How can we know that we're there? How can you know, Phil, I am doing that? How can I know that I am mimicking him and I'm on this road? I'm not all the way there, but I'm working toward it. I'm making progress to be more like Christ and walking in love. Two things, write them down. Really important. You write these two things down. Number one, a sacrifice for others. Are you a person who quickly sacrifices for others? He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. I will not call names, but I can literally walk my eyes through this sanctuary this morning and remember stories and times where I watch, watched you and witnessed you put someone else in front of you not someone that was one of your family members. Every person in this room that's worth their salt if their daughter broke down on the road somewhere would stop and go and help them, right? I'm talking about somebody, a total stranger. Or maybe even someone that even persecuted them, but they loved those people back. You know, Jesus didn't just love people that were lovable. In fact, he, he loved the most people like you and me that weren't very lovable at all. I mean, he laid down his life for people that did not deserve it. When's the last time you sacrificed for him? One of the ways you can know you're walking in love is when you're willing to stop what you're doing and your agenda and what you had planned for a disruption for somebody that may not even deserve it. When have you done that? I was telling a story out on the front wall this morning. We were on vacation this year. Most of you know that I, I will sit on a beach all day as long as you put me under a tent. And listen to me. Not an umbrella. Not one of these little mamby-pamby. I'm talking a 10 by 10 tent with stakes in the ground. It's not going anywhere. I mean, the, the wind can blow. It's not going to hurt the tent. I can be in the shade. I'll stay there all day long. Well, this past year, but we were there, and it was just me and Tracy and Faith on the beach. And I'll never forget, they were, they'll stay out in the sun all day. I mean, they love it. They can't get enough of it. I'm like, leave me back over here. I can take a little nap. I've learned how to dig a trench behind and make my seat lay back. I mean, I'm really good at it. I can, I can make that happen. But I looked over, and there's a, there's a lady over there, and she's she obviously a very young mother, and she's trying to nurse this infant. Now, let's just be, while we're here with the, 
Don't take your infant to the beach. Come on now. I mean, I'm talking newborn baby screaming and screaming and screaming, trying to breastfeed the little baby, and it just wasn't working. And the mother was there under this little bitty tiny little umbrella, and I just made my heart went out. I don't know those people. And I know the average person would just kind of put up with it and whatever. I'm like, I got to go. I walked, I said, listen, we got a 10 by 10 tent over here. We got some extra chairs. Please come over and be under this tent. You're welcome to stay all day. As long as I'm here and this tent's up, you're welcome. Are you serious? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. Please come and do that. Is your heart naturally the type of person that when you see a need, you want to do something about it? Did Jesus ever see a need and walk past it? How can we do such? When he's been so incredibly good to us, when he's blessed us the way he has, and maybe we don't have a million dollars to give somebody, but we got $20 we can give somebody. When's the last time you went without so somebody else could have? When you're in that place where you're willing to do something like that, you'll know that you're loving like he loves. And so, a sacrifice for others. You'll know that you're loving like that when you sacrifice. Number two, being quick to forgive. Now, this one's tough. Now, I went from preaching to meddling now, didn't I? It's hard to forgive. Have you ever been done wrong? Has someone ever said something horrible about you on Facebook or at school embarrassed you in any way or, or at work or wherever it may be? Whatever happens, someone was very, very, very unfair to you. Number one, don't make yourself out to be the victim. That's the worst thing, and we can all do it. We're really, really easy. When, when the world didn't go the way we want it to be, we can set ourselves up to be the victim. Don't do that. But how about this? Have you ever been in a place where someone hurt you and harmed you and even maybe liked it that they did that to you? And you had the opportunity at one point to return evil for evil, and instead you returned evil with love. I could tell you a ton of stories in my life when someone was very, very mean to me, and God, as only God can do it, gave me an opportunity later in life when they were down and they were hurting where I could have piled on where I could have literally gone and said, you know what? You reap what you sow, and I didn't do it. Instead, I went to a brother and loved on them and reached out to them and cared for them, and it floored them that I was willing to do that. But you know why I did that? Because it's Jesus who rules my heart. I don't love like that because I'm really a swell guy and I've just grown to be so. No, it's because Jesus truly rules in my heart. And if he rules in your heart and life, you'll become unbelievably sensitive to personal sin and you'll also be a person who's willing to sacrifice for others and forgive quickly. You need to hear this. I know I've preached it before, but please hear this. When you're walking around this life with unforgiveness in your life, Someone that did you wrong, that ex-wife, that ex-husband, that, that person at school. My wife has memories of things that were said to her way back in high school and I always tell her, forget about that and move on. When you choose to do that, you're walking around life with a ball and chain. You don't realize it, but you are. It's not bothering those people at all. It's bothering you. And so many of you for generations, it seems like just dragging that ball and chain around. And something amazing happens when you choose to truly forgive. Listen to me, not because they deserved it, not because they came to you and sought forgiveness. No, 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 no. You proactively saying, no matter what, I'm going to choose to forgive. What you do at that moment is you break that ball and chain off of you and you set yourself free. Do you think Jesus knew a little bit about forgiveness? All that he forgave was totally undeserved. Aren't you thankful he didn't wait for us to come and say, you know, I'm really, really sorry, Jesus, you know, and if you'll just give me a second, no. He chose to forgive you, period. Not when you got your life together, not when you started going to church, and not when you were reading your Bible every day and you were doing pro so much more progress than you did before. No. He loved you despite who you were. What would happen in this community if just in this room, the things that we're holding grudges over, we just cut them loose? <laughs> what if we were quick to forgive, quick to forget, and quick to love and to sacrifice? It's just a reminder. You're a child of God. Hey, why don't you start acting like it? You're a child of God. Why don't you start living like it? Well, what does that mean? Well, then I should be loving like he does. I should be mimicking who Jesus is in this world. This world needs that more than anything in the world. Number two, notice the recommendation. He tells us exactly what we need to be doing. A couple things here. Write these down. Number one, abhor immorality. Now we're going to start really meddling. Verse three, but immorality or 
any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. The word abhor means to hate, to be disgusted by. And he uses the word immorality. That's, that's the word pornea in Greek. It's where we get the word pornography from, if you're just looking for it. That word literally means all filthy sin. That's what it means. You fill in the blank. It's not just pornography. It's not just having an affair on your wife or whatever. I don't like that word anyway. Cheating on your wife, what it may be. It's not a, listen, you fill in the blank. Anything that is disgusting in the air of sexual sin, he says it should not even be named among you. Wow. This is the same one writing that wrote to the church in, Cor in Corinth. You remember we see, he, he shows up and he says, what in the world? You, these, these guys decided, you know, this stuff with Jesus is awesome. Let's bring that into worship. But does that mean we have to get rid of our temple prostitutes too? Yes. That's what happens when you begin to tolerate sin. They find out that there's a young man who's having an affair with his stepmother in the church. And Paul's not even mad about the church and necessarily letting that happen, it's that the leadership tolerated it and let it happen. And that's where we are as a nation today. And by the way, I don't want to preach this sermon right now, but we see churches left, right, and center saying, well, you know, I know the Bible says that homosexuality is not a sin, but, you know, it's a different day and it's a different time, and that's an old book, whatever. As the church endorses homosexuality, they're doing exactly the same thing we see happening right here. I'm not trying to be mean. I love all people. I don't care what color their skin is or what they, what they choose to go to bed with at night. That's not the point. The point is, how can we stand and say, say to people, that's okay when the Bible says it's not okay? And I know that's going to get me in trouble. I could go to jail in Canada right now for saying what I just said to you. That day's coming here. We know that. And so as we think about this, we need to, listen, we need to hate immorality. He doesn't say, you know, just stay away from it. Just don't have anything to do it. You know, he says, you should abhor it. You should hate immorality. You should hate that in your life. I know, listen to me. If you only knew what I know, people come to me every week and they, they share their problems with me. Every single week of my life, I counsel someone that's got something going on in their marriage or their life or their teenagers. That's what we do. And it can be overwhelming at times. And I've lost count on the hundreds and hundreds of individual men that I've counseled in just the last few years that are hooked on pornography. I get it. I know friends that are, they love alcohol. And when they see even a billboard that says, uh, come get your six pack of beer, man, it just tears them up. They just got to go do it. I'm not that guy. I don't even notice the sign. I've never had a desire to smoke cigarettes or do drugs or anything like that. But listen to me, any person, listen with this, all the, the internet has today, man, those, folk, those billboards are put out there for you every single day. I praise God. My wife taught me, y'all you know I'm a little tough when it comes to technology. I said, baby, why does this thing keep popping up, this girl in a bikini or whatever? Is there something I can do about that? She said, yeah, let me show you. If you punch this, you can say this and it won't do it anymore. And dude, I've done that so many times on my phone, none of that stuff shows up on my phone anymore. Praise God for that. But why is it, why is it that Facebook, and I'm only on that Facebook thing, so why is it that Facebook will let you show horrible pornography, disgusting stuff? But if you post a post about Jesus, they'll put a little flag by it. Are you kidding me? Seriously? That's where we are today, right? The world's become preachy. The world's become churchy. And the church has become worldly. Listen to me. What would happen if you came, became super sensitive to sin in your life and when you saw the picture of the bikini, the first thing was, how can I get rid of that? Not get sucked into that vortex. Right? Don't get all looking at the men. Do you think that maybe is not a women thing too? Do you don't think that gossip's the same way? Somebody said somebody about something. I'm going to fix that. I'll tell them and I'll, I'll post this. abhor immorality. Hate it. What if you decided, man, next time something comes up that's going to suck me in the front? I hate that. Are there some things that people hate in the room? Do y'all know this? Is, I've never had broccoli in my life unless it was an accident. It was, <laughs> it was in some, you know, Chinese thing, and I didn't know it was in the sauce, and it, it accidentally got in my mouth. <laughs> I really don't even know what it tastes like. I just don't want to find out. Right? <laughs> Aren't there some things in your life you just really hate? 
Come on now. What if we hated, hated immorality? What if the next time you were told that such and such slept around his wife and here's what's going to happen, there's going to be a divorce, you cried instead of gossiped? Or thought, well, that's just too bad. It broke your heart. What if the next time that, that you, you go to do the wrong thing or you go to look at something you should not look at or participate, that, that something within you, the Holy Spirit came and you were so sensitive that it never happened? You can, you're talking about a victory when you've caved and you've caved and you've caved and all of a sudden, not today, devil, not today. It can happen. We should hate it. Number two, avoid greed. Avoid greed, which is really hard in the United States. He says this, but immorality or any impurity, or he says greed. The word greed means intense, selfish desire for something, especially wealth or power. J.B. Phillips, one of my favorite commentators, said this. He says, it's the itch to get your hands on something that does not belong to you. And aren't we there today? Well, such and such just got him a new car. I got to have a new car. Such and such just got that brand new house. I got to have that. Such and such just got that toy. I got to have that toy. Such and such just upgraded their ring to this. I got to have that. Whatever. We just won't, 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 won't. We're talking this morning at the door while we're greeting about, have you noticed that they're building storage facilities everywhere? They're like ants. They're everywhere now. You know why? It's because we have too much stuff. Amen. Instead of getting rid of some of the stuff we have now to go get us some more stuff, we just pile it up somewhere else. And you're going to preach about this soon. Store up treasure in heaven where uh, moth and uh, moth and what? Store up treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, nor thieves steal away. Why don't we be storing up some treasure in heaven instead of on this earth? I can't wait to get rid of some of the stuff I have. As soon as I get up to my garage, I'm finally there. I'm going to go through there, man. This is going to be like it's like getting rid of day. And I'm not even talking about having a garage. So I'm like like take it to the dumpster or somewhere else. Get clean. Listen to me. Simplify your life. Quit being so greedy. That's hard in America. I know that. Some of us are fixing to go to a place called Honduras, and you're going to come back, and I promise you, if you've never been before, the first thing that's going to happen in your life is you're going to realize how unbelievably blessed you are and how much of a sin it is in America that we complain. Number three, arrest your speech. He says in verse four these words, and there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving thanks. Man, I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to do it. If you think that's an isolated scripture verse, it's not. Is there a sensitivity in your life as it comes to speech? Let me be honest with you. If I go to a movie and I start hearing the F word, I get up and leave. If I'm watching a television show and I hear that kind of language, I can't stay in the room. I'm nobody special, but I'm sensitive to that. I don't think I could sit there with Jesus by my side and watch that. So why am I going to sit there and watch that? Is there a sensitivity in your life about these things? Well, this is not an isolated passage either. Proverbs 18, verse 21, the power of life and death is in the tongue. James 1, 26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet not, does not bridle his own tongue, he deceives himself and his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. Proverbs 21, verse 23, he who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from trouble. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the one who desires life to love and many good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but that which is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so it will give grace to those who hear. The Bible says, out of the overflow and abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Did you know that? When you say something and you come back, oh, I really didn't mean that. Well, actually you did. <laughs> it came out of your heart. Can I be blunt and say, Filthy language should never come out of your mouth. If you have a problem with cussing, stop it. Don't ever say anything that you would not say in front of Jesus. It'll change everything. Because guess what? Everything you say, Jesus does hear. How about this? Stop going to places you would not go if Jesus was along your side 
when you're taking the Holy Spirit with you to those places. Choose not to participate in the things in this world that are on the edge, that maybe it's okay, maybe it's not. Listen, to it. have a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. It'll change everything. Let the things that you say with your mouth be wholesome and a blessing to people and not a curse. If you have a problem with gossiping, gossip is not a spiritual gift. It's a sin. Stop it. Be a child of God. Act like a child of God. Sound like a child of God. It's so, so important. The power of life and death exist in the tongue. There's just some recommendations. And that's not an exhaustive list. It's just a representative list. Let's finish this. Number three, notice the reason. Why should I do this? Phil, why in the world would I make the, the, the commitment today and be dedicated enough to ask God to help me be super sensitive to the personal sin in my life? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I don't normally do this, but let me read this for you. Don't turn. Just stay where you are. I want your heart where it is right now. I want you to hear these words with your heart. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. You can write that down. Listen to this carefully. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better that you lose one of your parts of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Verse 30, if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. We can have a long theological debate about is that serious? Is that what he's talking about? Here's what I believe. We should take sin super serious. Amen. And we don't. We just don't. We should take drastic measures with our personal sin, and we don't. Is he literally saying, hey, if, you, if you're looking at stuff you shouldn't look at, just pull your eye? No, I don't think he's saying that. What I'm saying is, take it serious. Listen to me. Gentlemen, if, if you've got pornography in your home, get rid of it. There's a really good solution for not doing it. If you, if you can't handle yourself on the Internet, there are blocks to help you with that. If you really care. Make your wife your best friend and make her above that your accountability partner. Let her see the things that you see. Let her have your passwords, whatever. We could go on and on and on about that. The point is simply this. Listen to me. You should take drastic measures to avoid sin. I know no, no one preaches this. That's what that's saying. Don't pluck your eye out, but take it serious. Don't go cut your right hand off. Take it serious. Paul paints an incredible picture in these last few verses, and it's really, truly this, this story. We're all on this pathway that is going to divide. You need to know this. This is an absolute fact. We're all walking through this life, but there's two destinations. So listen carefully to these last words. Verse 5, for this you know with certainty, he says, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, please hear me, because this is important. We're not saved because we're perfect. We're saved because he's perfect. We fall short, and we need his forgiveness. Don't miss that. He's not saying here the only way, I know there's people in this town that believe that. If I, you know, if I spit my gum on the sidewalk and Jesus comes back, I'm going to hell. That's not true. Don't spit your gum on the sidewalk. It's just not a good thing to do, but it's not going to send you to hell. No one in this world ever went to heaven sinless. We fall short. He covers that, right? But hear this, those who habitually practice these things, those who walk in these evil things, and nothing seems to phase them, there's no sensitivity in your life to personal sin. Listen to me, you need to check that out. I don't care when you got baptized or what confirmation class you went through or they baptized you as an infant or you've been, man, you haven't missed a Sunday in church in 25 years. None of that will save you. Only Jesus will. But I'll tell you this, if you are under the blood, if you really know the Jesus that I met, you'll never be the same. You can't be the same. 
And it's not out of a sense of duty. Man, I divorced myself of that a long time ago. I do not serve Jesus because the Bible tells me to. I don't do it because it's the right thing to do. I do it because I love Jesus with all of my heart. He gave everything for me. And I fall so short of his glory, but I get up and I try every day to do the best I can to serve him with his grace and with his mercy to be more like him and to be more sensitive to personal sin in my life. Not to make my name great, but to make his name great, to show how great he is. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. Don't miss this. And there are many who enter through it. The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. The best demographics we have to measure what it truly means to be saved in this world, I mean, true, true doctrine would say that three-fourths of the world's population is lost. If indeed salvation is a Christ who loved you so much that God sent him into this world, he died a and he lived an incredible, perfect life and died a tragic but voluntary death on the cross and was resurrected three days later and is alive today. If you believe that's the gospel story, about 25% of the world believes that. There are other versions and all kinds of things on there, but if you add to that story, it's not that story anymore. Why is the way which leads to destruction? And many are those who find it, yes. In other words, if Jesus split the sky and came back right now, most likely three-fourths of the world's population will not go to heaven. And so write two things down. Here's the reason. Why should I want to be sensitive to person? Why should I want to be in Christ and know that I'm in Christ and be super sensitive to the sin in my life and to try to emulate him in this world? Here's two reasons. Number one, because without Christ, we have no eternal inheritance. As a pastor, I, I would love to show you, and I wish I had video of the times when I've done a, over a thousand funerals in my life, and I can't tell how many times that there's been a, a death of a, of a loved one that maybe had a lot of money. And the kids, some of the kids came to visit, some didn't come, and they found out when they read the will that they didn't get anything. Oh, they showed up. They were Johnny on the spot. They never came when they were sick, but they showed up for the funeral because they thought there might be something in for them. And I've, I've known before they read the will because they talked to me, it's going to be tough for such and such because there's nothing for them. What if I were to tell you if you're not in Christ? I'm not talking about religious. I'm not talking about a member of the church. or you got. What if I to told you this morning if you're not genuinely in Christ Jesus, there's a reckoning day coming and there's no inheritance for you. That's what Paul says. And he reminds us that we're known not by anything else except the fruit in our lives. In other words, if I'm truly saved, something will be different about me. There'll be something different in you. Number two, because without Christ, we will experience God's wrath. Verse six, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Every person has a, when I use the word heaven, I don't know, there's three, four hundred people here, whatever, there's a different thought in everyone's mind what it's like. And guess what? None of us are right. <laughs> I mean, none of us are right. It's so much greater than our minds can even fathom. And it's so much greater than we'll even know. One day, we'll all close our eyes in this world. And I believe that all people will stand before the Lord one day and give an account for their life. But here's what I believe, and I'm, I'm wrong. Did I admit to you I'm wrong? Can you imagine the technology they must have in heaven? Let's pick on Phil. If I were to die and I'm, I come and stand before the Lord, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, Right? Let's imagine I'm standing before the Lord and, and let's just imagine they have this incredible technology, maybe a nice screen like this, but so much nicer. And they, they play, they start to play the movie of the life of Phil Griffin, those 61 years and there'd probably be some funny things and some not so funny things and some good things and some bad things. And I don't suspect it probably get past my first few years on this earth before 
all of a sudden the screen would go blank and it would turn blood red. Because I'm covered by the blood of Calvary. Let's imagine that I'm not covered by the blood of Calvary. One day I'll stand before the Lord One, the Holy One of God, who is holy, holy, holy. And they start playing the movie of my life. They'll see it all. There'll be no interruption. Nothing covered. How's it going to go for you? Brent Lamb wrote a song years ago called I Love You Anyway. It goes something like this. To think I gave my life to die so you might live. This is God talking to you. To think I gave my life to die so you might live. A persecuted price, but I was willing to give. Still the question goes on, was my suffering in vain? I did it all for you now. Your rejection brings me shame. But I love you anyway. And I just want you to know this time slips away. My love will only grow. I'll never turn away no matter what you do. Because I made a lifetime investment in you. You opened up your heart. Your life was changed that day. The angels all rejoiced as your sins were washed away. But now it's been so long since you've even called upon my name. Am I no longer your first love? Does our friendship bring you shame? But I love you anyway. And I just want you to know that as time slips away, my love will only grow. I'll never turn away, no, no matter what you do. Because I made a lifetime investment in you. And he did. He did. So I guess my question is today, is the reason there's no sensitivity in your life to personal sin because you really don't know him? Maybe you're comparing your deeds and actions to your neighbor and they're a little bit better than that, so I'm good to go. No, he's holy. He's holy. He's holy. And he saved you that daily we would become more like him. And that starts with sensitivity to personal sin. So what do you need to do today? What do I need to do today to be more sensitive to the sin in my life? so that I can learn from where I am now to be better next time, to make better choices, and to honor him more. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, I've got great news for you. You can today. There's nothing in the world that God would rather do than save your heart today. And that's a total work of God, by the way. You can't do this, only he can. But if you would yield your life to him today, ask him to forgive you of your sin, to wash you in the blood of Calvary and save your soul. I promise you, if you mean it, he'll do it. You can be delivered today. If you're just one of us old crusty Christians that's been around for a while and we just kind of got blind spots now because we used to have a sensitivity about that. There used to be something that triggered in us and it's like the trigger's gone out now. I just... I used to have a fuel gauge on my jet ski that worked. It doesn't work anymore. And so now I got to be really careful that I make sure I put some... Look, there must be something in your life that used to be super sensitive to, and you know right now you're not anymore. What are you going to do about that? God, these are your people. This is your church. And I know no one preaches about stuff like this anymore, but sin is our problem. It all can be traced back to sin. And Lord, I could say with the Apostle Paul, I'm the chief of all sinners. I'm not here to talk down to anyone, God. I'm here to talk to myself as I talk to these amazing people. I just wonder what it would be like, God, if we truly got sensitive to personal sin. Not pointing the finger at others when they fall, but pointing the finger at ourselves. That we would maintain a life that would be pleasing to you that we would mimic you in this world, Father, by the way that we live and by the way that we love. God, we want to get to a place where we're sensitive to the things that break your heart. And all I know to do is ask. You said in your word, if we lack wisdom, to ask for it. God, we ask for wisdom. We want to know how to navigate through this life 
and honor you in it. And Lord, we fall down and we mess up and we're so thankful for your grace and mercy. For that one God that's in this room who habitually lives in a place without any sensitivity to it that they know does not honor you. God, visit with them now. Make us more like Jesus. In Christ's name I pray.